It is such an honor <clears throat> to be in this place, to stand in this sacred place. How often over the years have I have stood here and listened to the gift of our music. I've said, Bill, just shut up and give the benediction. <laughs> but I'm not going to do that today. <clears throat> but we are so blessed with the music in this place. It's a joy to be here, but frankly, it's a joy to be here every Sunday sitting in the back. And the purpose of that, reason of that joy, among many others, is our pastor, Chris Henry. Chris, thank you for all the gifts with which you bless us, the vision with which you are leading us. We are a blessed congregation because of you, and I say thank you and bless you. In our epistle listen this morning, we are listening in on a conversation between Paul and Christians in the church in Corinth. Now, Corinth is a cosmopolitan city where East meets West. And Paul's congregation has in it people with a Greco-Roman heritage, people who are enamored with what they call Sophia, wisdom, cleverness, intelligence. In our reading today, Paul introduces another kind of wisdom, God's wisdom. But it's a wisdom framed in mystery. At the same time, a wisdom confounding those people who, well, think they know everything. Listen for God to speak. When I came to you, brothers and sisters, I did not come proclaiming the mystery of God to you in lofty words of wisdom. No, I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. So I came to you in weakness, in fear, and with much trembling. My speech and my proclamation were not plausible words of wisdom, but a demonstration of the Spirit and power, so that your faith might rest not on human wisdom, but on the power of God. Yet among the mature we do speak wisdom, though it is not the wisdom of this age or the rulers of this age who are doomed to perish. Rather, we speak God's wisdom, secret and hidden, which God decreed before the ages of our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, nor has the human heart conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. These things are revealed to us through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This morning I want to have a conversation with you about life, about God, but also about you. When someone asks you if you believe in God, I suspect that most of you who are here today would say we do. But what do you say if you are asked the next question? Tell me why do you believe in God? How do you respond? My hunch is that most of us do not respond with philosophical arguments. We simply tell stories, very personal stories. Stories reflecting our encounters with God and our experience of things holy. A young Lutheran theologian, Andy Root, says that living in the world we do, a world shorn of the divine, the best way to talk about God is to talk about everyday life, to tell stories. And so we tell stories because, well, God is deeply incarnational. In Jesus Christ, God acts and arrives in history. God is a personal being who moves in time and identifies with events. 
As Chris said, it was over two years ago when he invited me to preach, and then came COVID. And frankly, it's rather scary to have two plus years to think about a text. <laughs> and so this year, I, I found myself looking at our text through the lens of my life. And I made what for me was a rather interesting discovery. I discovered that for all of my life, I have been playing hopscotch with a virus, albeit a spiritual virus. I call the virus the eschatological twitch because it's a virus that somehow unnerves me whenever I look at the future that I don't know what it holds. When I look at the future of things that I, I really cannot control, and then I become rather anxious. As St. Paul writes, no eye has seen, nor ear heard, no human mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. And I read that text in a, well, a, a sense of wonderment washes across my mind, sparking curiosity. What is the future? How do we understand it? The contemporary philosopher Charles Taylor says that we live in an age which he describes as an age of the malaise of modernity. And by that he simply means in our search for authentic, for what is real, we find that search going on in a world suspicious of the supernatural. And so we tell stories. I think I was four, maybe five years old when I first became aware of the virus. By the way, do you remember the first time as a child you ever thought about death? My mother was gone for the night. We were living with her parents, and my bedroom was upstairs at the end of a long, long hallway that seemed to run forever. And so it was my granny who tucked me in bed that night, and we went through the usual ritual with the prayer, Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. Ah, if I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take a curious prayer <laughs> with which to tuck a child in bed and leave them alone <laughs> in a world of hungering darkness. <laughs> and I began to think, what happens to people when they die? Well, I had no sophisticated cosmology. In my simple mind, I, I lived in a three-storied word, which meant you only had two directions. You went up or you went down. And I knew at least from hearing the preacher, you sure didn't want to go down. But more to the point, I knew precisely where down was. It was in my grandfather's basement a humongous, coal-burning, fire-eating, flame-throwing furnace with peekaboo holes in the doors. It was scary. And every time I went to that basement, somehow I thought of a story my uncle had told me from the book of Daniel, the three Hebrew children who were tossed into a fiery furnace by the brutish king Nebuchadnezzar. Well, that was the furnace. <laughs> you didn't want to go down. I don't know how long I lay there fussing and turning before the door opened. My granny peered in and she said, Billy, are you okay? No, granny. I said, tell me, what would happen to me if I died? I wouldn't go to that big furnace, would I? Chuckling, my granny said, of course not, Billy. And then growing serious, she said, Billy, remember this. You are God's child. You belong to God. And God is a God of love. Looking back on that night, 80-some years ago, it was as if this roomy God walked into my bedroom that night in the person of my granny and answered two of life's foundational questions. Who am I? I am God's child. I am made in God's image. And who is God? What is God like? God is a God of love. And she said a little prayer, and I slipped 
into sleep, at peace with life and with the world, the eschatological itch. How can I describe it? It's a rather grating of the soul that frequently grabs us at the intersections, the turning points of life. A kind of irritant that raises prickly questions like, am I as a human alone, on my own, homeless, in a yawning universe? Or perchance, am I something, part of something that is bigger than myself? You see, the eschatological itch is God scratching at the window pane of our lives, suggesting in the words of our text that maybe, maybe, just maybe, there is more to life than we humans can conceive with our minds and see with our eyes. 19th century poet Francis Thompson had an had a intriguing way of talking about this eschatological itch. He called it the hound of heaven, the saga of a stealthy God who in his words tracks us down the nights and days of life, the arches of the years with unhurrying pace and unperturbed chase. Well, think about the stories that you tell. How often do your stories reflect a crucial intersection, a turning point in life? Turning points, and I think of a trip I had with 22 of your sons and daughters, the first Footsteps of Faith trip about 20 years ago. Late one night, we were sitting in the lounge of our ship until the wee hours of the morning talking about life, about faith, about God. Young people at one of those intersections leaving home, entering college and university for the first time on their own. I think of a husband who had little place for religion in his life, and then one day, he found himself looking down, holding in his arms his firstborn child. And a new set of questions crossed his mind. What, what does it mean to be a parent? And what are the moral values that my wife and I are to pass on to this, our child? And the journey of faith began turning points. I think of that story in Luke's gospel, we call it the story of the rich young ruler. I like to think it's a story of a 30-something. He's young, he's wealthy, he's religious, he has social class, he's climbing to the top of the corporate ladder. And yet, a kind of hollowness shreds his soul. So, he comes to Jesus. He has one simple question. Jesus... What's life eternal all about? In other words, how can I find meaning and purpose in life? And Jesus' answer, well, it's downright disarming. Jesus simply says, well, first of all, forget your money. Forget your social status. Forget your religiosity. And just come on along and follow me. What does it mean for us to follow Jesus? The late Dutch priest Henry Nouwen has a little book with that title in which he makes this astute observation. He says, often you and I are more wanderers than followers. We run around a lot. We do a lot of different things. Or we just sit and do nothing. So Jesus says, stop running around. Don't just sit there. Find a purpose for your life. Follow me. What's it mean for us to follow Jesus? I am always intrigued. What's it mean for you who sit in these pews to follow Jesus in the world in which you live and work post-Sunday? One day many years ago, I was having that conversation with my late friend Steve Bering. Steve was a elder in this congregation, but... Many of you will know the name because for 18 years, Steve was the president of Purdue University. And as we were talking about this question, Steve said, well, let me tell you a story. One day, a rather disgruntled student came into my office. She was very upset with me. She had on her wrist one of those bracelets that had on it the letters WWJD, what would Jesus do? 
And she was absolutely convinced that I was not doing what her Jesus was telling her that I should do. I listened, he said. And then after all, I said, well, you know, I too am a Christian. And I too live with that question, what would Jesus have me do? But the difference is this. The answer is not, what do you think your Jesus is telling you to tell me to do? The answer is, what is the Jesus I follow telling me to do? And a light bulb flashed in my mind. Following Jesus is different from following a famous person or joining a movement or embracing a certain protocol. To follow Jesus is to take the time to listen. To listen to our lives. To listen to what is happening all around us. We all travel different roads, our roads reflecting our circumstances and our calling. But whatever the road, to follow Jesus is to live life in His Spirit, His light, with His heart, but with our spirit, our heart, our light. To follow Jesus is to work for the flourishing of all the institutions and organizations of which we are a part. In short, it is to become carriers of grace in the neighborhoods where we live. The eschatological itch. I sense that today that itch has become acute COVID has awakened us all to the fragility of life and our own mortality. I was awakened to that almost two years ago when I read a, a post in f Facebook put by a young mother in this congregation. She simply wrote last night, my doctor husband came home from the hospital. He's working in the emergency room now. And he said to me, dear, you and I have to sit down and have a conversation we've never talked about. We need to talk about my death. The fact that I could capture this disease and I would die. The eschatological itch. It raises the ultimate question about life beyond death. How do we as Christians envision God's tomorrow? And in what kind of a God do we believe? Our text suggests that God's tomorrow is beyond what we can see, hear, or comprehend. And so the Bible offers no blueprints for tomorrow, but it does something most interesting. It paints pictures with words. Jesus told stories. We call them parables, and they are meant to serve as windows through which we catch hints and glimmers of God's tomorrow. But note this. Note it, all of those are frost-coated windows as if we were peering through a foggy glass scene but moving shadows. And yet, they are pictures to spark our imagination because they assure us of this, there is a tomorrow. And we are part of God's tomorrow, albeit it's a tomorrow framed in mystery. How do you live with that mystery? I love the tongue-in-cheek answer of the poet Mary Oliver. She says, you know, I don't really care too much how many angels dance on the head of a pin. It's just enough for me to know that there are angels. <laughs> and they dance. It's enough to know that we are part of something bigger than ourselves. Now we know in part, but one day we will know fully. Frosty windows. And I think of a passage in John's Gospel. The disciples understand that they do not have too much time with Jesus, and so they're curious. They say, Jesus, where are you going? Can we come along too? 
And Jesus' answer is, well, it's, it's simply uncanny. Jesus simply says, don't worry about it. Don't worry, trust me. Trust God. In my Father's house, there are many rooms, many rooms, many rooms. And guess what? I'm going to get your room ready for you. And when it's ready, I'll come back and get you so that you can live where I live. The God we see in Jesus is a roomy God. A God who excludes no one and makes room for everyone. The life, the death, the resurrection of Jesus all reveal to us the roominess of God because Easter is now the lens through which we look at God's tomorrow. And it's a lens assuring us that there is more to life than death. But Easter tells us something else. It tells us that ultimately, you and I live in the world that will be one day ambushed by grace. Ambushed by grace. And some of the hairs at the back of my mind begin to stand up because I say to myself, well then, whatever happens to justice? I, I rather like this roomy God, but I don't know that I want God to get too roomy. And I began to think about, well, some of the others in my life, maybe you, some of the others in you life, your life, people who have offended you, people who have done you wrong, people who have betrayed you, people who have different social, political, religious viewpoints than yours. And sometimes bad people, just plain criminals, who make the headline news, and ah, something there is inside me that says that all these people have to have their comeuppance. Justice. And I'm looking again at one of those frosty stories Jesus told. It's our gospel lesson today. Jesus is in Jerusalem. His death is imminent. His critics are ready to arrest him, but they're curious. They have one last question to ask him. Jesus, you always talk about your kingdom. What do you mean by your kingdom, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus answers their question by telling the story. We call it the parable of the wedding banquet. It really is the story of a God who, as host for the party, goes to the slums and alleyways of life to invite people, Street people, renegades, all those others. All those others to sit at the table. <laughs> One of my favorite theologians, Yale theologian Miroslav Wolf, describes it as a story of exclusion and embrace. It's a story reminding us that, well, in heaven there will be some people we don't like. And then Wolf has the audacity to suggest that if you and I are really going to enjoy heaven, that maybe something else must change in us. Well, one day following his lecture on this topic, a young student came up to him. She was African-American. Anger blistered her faith as images, memories of racism frosted her mind. She turned to him and she said, Professor, do you know what you are saying? And Wolf simply replied, I know. It's scandalous, isn't it? And for just a moment, they both stood there. And then she whispered, but it wouldn't be heaven if it were otherwise, would it? This last year, as I began to read this story through the lens of Easter, well, a rather heretical thought crossed my mind. I wonder, might this story of a wedding banquet simply be a preview of the opening night in God's heaven? The gala that sets everything into motion? A wedding banquet 
a grace-filled event freeing us for life in the kingdom. And I began to think about some of the others in my life, one other in particular, my father, a man I never knew. My parents divorced when I was six years of age. My father was living in another town. I had not seen him for several years. I was in middle school, junior high school. It was my birthday, so he came to town one Saturday to take me to lunch. And as we sat at lunch, my dad said, Well, Billy, what would you like for Christmas? I said, Well, Dad, you know, a lot of the guys on the basketball team have wristwatches. I would love to have a wristwatch. So after lunch, we went around the corner of the jewelry store, and ah, there it was, that beautiful gold-rimmed Elgin watch with brown straps. And then Christmas came, and Christmas went. No watch, no card, no call. Never again did I talk to my dad. My dad died my junior year in college. There was no way I was going to that funeral because an ist ulcer, an ulcer blistered my soul. I wanted nothing to do with my dad. And then one night, about the time I turned 40, this roomy God, <laughs> this roomy God walked into my field of dreams. And my dad came to me. He said, I'm sorry. He said, I really look forward to heaven when we'll get to know each other. I can't say for sure what happened that night. All I know is that when I woke up, the ulcer was gone and I was free to tell my story. Wishful thinking? I think not. The writer Frederick Beeker describes wishful thinking as simply the wings that truth comes true on. And so now, as I await the turn to life's final corner, I rather find myself looking forward to that event. What's it going to be like? What's going to happen? And as I think about it, the words of an old Negro spiritual begin to hum in my mind, oh, one of these days, yes, one of these days I'm going to have a seat at the banquet table, one of these days. One of these days, I'm going to have a seat at the welcome table, and I'm going to feast on milk and honey one of these days. One of these days, I'm going to sit at the welcome table, and I'm going to tell God just how you treat me. The welcome table. It's a table of joy and also a table of justice. Justice, where confession and repentance takes place. Joy, because it's justice framed in mercy, freeing us for all new relationships. Joy and justice. Locking arms in the great tangle of redemption and reconciliation. The eschatological itch. It's a virus reminding us that indeed we are part of something bigger than ourselves. It's the saga of a roomy God. And God be praised. Amen.